All right. Good evening, Endo Summit Live, and welcome to the second in our 2022-2023 season. Tonight, we are talking about a topic that is something that affects us all with endometriosis because we're talking about teen endometriosis. And most of our symptoms did not develop like in our 30s, even though that's when we were diagnosed. So if we were to talk about teen endometriosis and have this conversation more in depth and more frequently, we could maybe change lives. And that's what we're going to try one webinar at a time with the Endometriosis Summit. Good evening to Dr. Iris Orbuck. Doctor, can you introduce yourself? I love seeing all these faces. It's so mutual. I so too. I love seeing your smiling face and being here with two amazing providers who like our champions of endo. Um, I'm Dr. Iris Karen Orbach. I'm based out of Los Angeles. I specialize, did a fellowship in excision of endo, but more than anything, I'm a huge advocate for raising awareness, early diagnosis, picking up endo in teens. Um, like it makes me so happy. I operated on a 12 year old about 10 days ago. And do you know how happy that made me? because the trajectory of her life is radically different. I picked up endo in my daughter as a teenager. Her life is totally different. And I'm here just to help raise awareness. And I could go through like this, the stuff I've published, but I think just you'll be able to see my passion and um, about what I love to do, so. We are gonna share one thing that you published. Do you wanna tell everybody about your book? Yeah, sure. Um, because our, uh, everybody should go out and get this book. All right. Yeah. A labor of love of mine to help raise awareness is beating endo, how to reclaim your life from endometriosis. And it approaches endo from a multidisciplinary, holistic, eats me swests approach with the understanding that the cornerstone of treating endo is excision of endometriosis. Wonderful. Now also joining us from New York City, Dr. Tay Ahmed. And Dr. Ahmed is here to talk about how it's not all about cutting when it comes to treating endometriosis. Welcome, Dr. Ahmed. Can you introduce yourself? Hi. Um, so I am Dr. Ahmed, and I am working out of pelvic rehabilitation medicine in New York City. Um, I treat pelvic floor dysfunction in both men and women, um, but a majority of our patients, I'd say about, you know, almost close to 50% of our patients have endometriosis, which is kind of wild. Um, when we first started it, we were seeing a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction in, you know, vaginismus patients and different types of um, different scenarios. But what we realized if we kept digging, we'd find out, oh, well, do you have, tell me about your painful, um, your, your periods, are they painful? When did they start? Are there any associated symptoms? And we realized so many more people had endometriosis. And, you know, even now when I see like 20 year olds, we find out that, you know, in their teenage years, so many of them had these symptoms and they were put on birth control and we don't know what their symptoms are like now. So it's really important and um, kind of why we're here today to talk about endometriosis and making sure we get it diagnosed early um, to prevent things that happen in the future. Excellent. Excellent. And joining us again, we have a whole California panel here this evening is Dr. Mona Arati. Dr. Arati, can you introduce yourself to everyone? Sure. So I'm Dr. Mona Arati. I am a minimally invasive GYN surgeon based out of San Francisco, California. I'm actually starting a fellowship for someone to learn endometriosis if uh, that's SLS affiliated. So if someone's interested in applying, if there are any doctors out there or gynecologists that want to learn all about endometriosis, they can um, message me and we can start. I am looking for actively looking for a fellow currently. Um, and I used to teach fellowship, um, at Cleveland clinic and at Henry Ford hospital, my previous jobs at the center for endometriosis and fibroids at Cleveland clinic and at the center for minimally invasive surgery at Henry Ford hospital in Detroit. So I've been doing endometriosis surgery for almost 15 years now. And, um, one of my passions is really, you know, trying to make surgery less invasive. And again, that holistic approach. 
um, to our patients. It's not just about doing the surgery and then send them on their way, but really getting them to that state of pain free with the multidisciplinary approach and using different techniques for pain management and management of the associated conditions of endometriosis. Um, and it is a passion of mine to catch um, teenagers early. I was unfortunately one of those teens curled up on the floor, crying, being taken to the ER and being told I had constipation um, for many, many years before I became a gynecologist. And I realized I actually have endometriosis and that was why my periods were so awful as a teenager. So um, I just don't want anyone to go through that. Um, and I have so many patients now that I've treated their mothers and now they're, they're dragging in, you know, their three daughters or their two daughters or, you know, for evaluation and treatment for endometriosis, because as we know, it is hereditary and it does run in families. So, I, and I think we can make, really make a difference by diagnosing it early. So teen, teen diagnosis, early diagnosis is really quite a passion of mine. Yes. A passion of all of ours. So let's um, break it down right from the beginning. How, and, and Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Orbach, it's probably a little bit different, your evaluations, but talk to me, Dr. Orbach, somebody comes to your office, what are the things about teen endometriosis? They're, say they're, let's say they're 15, so they're not, you know, nine, which I'm sure that happens too, but what, what are the things that you're talking to them about? What are you looking for? So first of all, I think you should have, to, I have two daughters, so to understand a teenager feels so uncomfortable being in a gynecologist's office. They feel uncomfortable about speaking about anything personal, let alone in front of their parent or caregiver, whoever's bringing them. So I typically will either take off my white coat. I make the environment really comfortable for them. And I ask them, you know, tell me what brings you here. You know, I've got all the time in the world. Start from the beginning. Tell me whatever you want to tell me. And it allows them to start to feel like this comfortable rapport with me. Um, and ultimately, usually if the mom is there or the caregiver, grandmother, whomever, they typically will add a lot to the story. Um, but I, I'm looking for anything about when did their pain start? Is it help? Are they withdrawing from doing what they love, like playing tennis or you know being on the set, putting together a play at school or hanging out with friends? Um, I'm picking up, do they have any gut issues? Have they been to the gastroenterologist? Um, and I'm, I'm asking them specific questions because you have to understand whether someone's a teenager or 20 or 30 year old, if they're having a bowel movement every three days or they're straining on the toilet for 25 minutes, that's normal to them. So they'll always report, oh, it's normal, it's normal, it's normal, because maybe they've watched their mom or their grandmother sit in the bathroom. So I, I get down and dirty with them. I'm like, well, let's talk about your bowel movements. What do they look like? And they chuckle and they laugh and they turn a little red, but I'm really trying to ascertain as much as I can from them. Um, and then once they start to giggle a little, they soften up a little bit and then they're, they're able to speak a little bit more. But so all um, gut issues, all urological issues, um, what makes them better. And then honestly, for me, physical exam, obviously I don't do an internal exam on my patients. I can even just tell by doing, by questioning them because my first consult's about an hour and a half and I've already read all their records. You know, sometimes they've had records this big, sometimes they have one or two records, but even just an abdominal exam, if I evaluate their abdominal muscles and there's um, like a really overactive active rectus on one side and it's much less on the other, I already know, I mean, either they have scoliosis or hip issues, but I already know their anatomy is pulled one way or another at that young age, just by their abdominal exam. Um, so it's, it's just spending a lot of time and questioning them. Excellent. And Dr. Ahmed, what's your approach to, because somebody typically will come to you, not because they think they have endometriosis, but mm -hmm. because they have pain. So how does your approach differ a little bit? So most of our patients who are coming in, they, they, the assumption is, is they have some sort of pain. I mean, obviously sometimes patients come in and they say they're not having pain. They may feel a little bit of a disconnect or they feel weird. Um, but most of our patients will say, you know, I'm here, I either have pain with sex or maybe I'm chronically constipated and they've never heard the word endometriosis before. So I kind of, you know, get their whole story 
try to understand what are their bowel movements looking like? Are they, what do they physically look like? How often are they happening? Are they pushing? Are they straining? Most of the times patients have already gone to multiple GI doctors and they've been told, well, I either have IBS or, but now I'm reading about this thing called pelvic floor dysfunction. And sometimes they show up wondering, okay, do I have pelvic floor dysfunction? And then we have to go further into like, well, tell me a little bit about what your menstrual you know, cycles are like, how often are they irregular? Sometimes they're irregular, they're put on birth control. I was on this pill, now I'm not on this pill. I was, maybe I was on Depo, maybe I'm not taking it, or now I have an IUD. Um, if they're coming in and they have pain with sex, um, they you know, often will say, you know, I, I can't put a tampon in, I can't put a, you know, a, a, a penis in, I, you know, nothing with a digital penetration, everything hurts. Um, or I had good intercourse and now I'm not having good intercourse. And then we get into the story of how are the, how are the, you know, your menstrual cycles now? Is it, were they better before? Are they worse now? Are you having increased pain, increased guarding in your abdomen? Are you now finding it harder to put in a tampon? Was it okay before? Um, and you know, that whole story similar to Iris, we have to like put it all on a timeline and get an idea of what, what has happened, what has changed, what's gotten better, what's gotten worse. Um, and are, have there been any interventions in between? Now, do you feel, I feel it's changed a lot just in the time I've been practicing, but do you feel like it used to be like you would hide your tampon in your sleeve and you'd scurry off to the, or, or you would make up some excuse to miss Jim, you know, and um, do you feel the three of you that people are, teens are more open about their pain now, Dr. Arati? Yeah, I think they are. Like, I think that the, the girls are talking more about it. There's a lot more social on social media about it. There's a lot more awareness about endometriosis. Luckily, you know, as much as social media has been a detriment in some things in our society, it's, it's been very good for awareness and things like that. And often, you know, by the time someone's gotten to me, they've already at least heard of endometriosis or know one or two people who have it. Um, and they can, you know, they can describe their symptoms and they're starting to, I mean, a lot of them do think that some of their symptoms are normal, like passing out on their periods or throwing up on their periods or things like that. But once you start explaining to them what a normal menstrual cycle is, and they have talked to their friends, they know what their other friends, um, what their pain is typically like. So, you know, I start just listing all the pathognomonic um, symptoms of endometriosis. And a lot of times, you know, they start to realize that those symptoms, they, they do have them. And usually they're pretty progressive. So, you know, they, they get worse with time. So, you know, when they were 12, it was different than they were 13 and they were 14, they, you know, they were 15. Like usually I think teens get diagnosed and they're somewhere between 14 and 16, typically um, about one to two years after onset of symptoms. So um, if they have a mother that's had a history of endometriosis, if not, a lot of them don't get diagnosed till later, unfortunately. And they just typically see their pediatrician who puts them on a birth control pill, which typically will fail um, within a couple of years. So that's uh, because because of inadequate suppression, inadequate treatment. So it's a whole can of worms there. We could really have a conversation about should a pediatrician be no, placing yeah. a teenager on the pill? I mean, I mean, I don't think I don't think it's bad for them to put them on the pill for contraception or to put them on the pill maybe for for menorrhagia or heavy periods or something like that. But if they really have pain or especially pain before the period, which I think is pretty much pathic mnemonic for endometriosis, because the, there's a misnomer that um, dysmenorrhea is, you know, the, the treatment for dysmenorrhea, dysmenorrhea is uh, OCPs, because that's what ACOG puts out there. But that's primary dysmenorrhea, meaning pain that starts with periods, starting with the first period, during the period. That does not mean that pain one or two days before the period is dysmenorrhea. That's not. That's, that's pelvic pain. And that's usually when endometriosis pain starts initially, is it actually leading up, I call it the pre, the pre-menstrual cramping. The pre-menstrual cramping is typically endometriosis pain, not, uh, not the actual dysmenorrhea. Dysmenorrhea can be, it can be primary dysmenorrhea, it can be adenomyosis, juvenile adenomyosis, it can be endometriosis. But for me, the just real distinguishing factor is that most of my teens with endometriosis, they have the preview pain, the pain the day before. 
or two days before, or 12 hours before, or three days before, or a week before, uh, and the symptoms that start the week before. That is not dysmenorrhea, and that shouldn't be diagnosed as dysmenorrhea and shouldn't be treated as dysmenorrhea. And I think that's where a lot of pediatricians kind of get mixed up, that that's not period pain. It's before the period, so it's not period pain. So, so show of hands, how many of you, the primary symptom, the initial first symptom that people have is stomach related in teens. Yeah. yeah. We all what... see that, right? So yeah. Dr. Warbach, I, I somewhat remember you, um, you probably would know, we missed you last week because we were looking for the statistics and Gabby and um, Dr. Mangishikar didn't know it. And I said, Iris would know this. How many teens that show IBS in their history really go on to be diagnosed with endometriosis? You know, that's such a great question. I've never seen data like, like that. I think it'd be very hard to even quantify it. But a question I always do ask my patients, whether they're coming in at 12 or 16 or 36, is did you have, ever have stomach aches as a kid? And what I typically see, let's say they began menstruating at 12, very often they'll say two years prior or three years prior, that's when their stomach aches began or my constipation started. And, and it's because the hormones are real, you know, really turning on, you know, you have axillary hair, you have pubic hair, and then eventually, you know, you get your period. I forget which order those come in. I don't do that stuff anymore. But the point is, is that your hormones have been, you know, coming into play for two, three years before the onset of your menses anyways. And I really do believe that people are born with endo implants, whether it's genetic or it's environmental. And so then those implants are exposed to the hormones um, a couple of years beforehand. So if I had to quantify over the last almost 20 years in my practice, because I do ask everybody, I would probably say, um, it, probably about 70% of my patients have gut issues preceding their menses. And, and we talk, yeah, we talked uh, about, yeah, I would say 50% for me, 50, 50 to 70% have, you know, nausea, vomiting, bloating, constipation, whatever it is, some sort of GI symptom preceding the week before their, their period. And usually for teens that, they, that that's usually the blame is IBS is, is often the, the diagnosis they come in with. Can I, yeah, doctor? In? Dr. Ahmed, do they hit your practice? I have constipation without ever realizing that it could be endometriosis. You know, what a lot of them will say is that I have all, I have, I'm here for constipation. I have some, maybe some urinary symptoms, maybe not a ton nausea, vomiting, but I can't have endo because my periods aren't that bad. And so then we have to explain to them how you can have like endo isn't just like, oh, you have bad endo and you know, your implants are really bad inside. And a lot of them will say, well, I don't want to have a surgery now just to take out potential endo when my sit, my, my menstrual cycle isn't that bad. And I just have constipation. So that's where it, that playing the like for, for what I tell them is, okay, let's treat your pelvic floor. Let's see if things get better. And if your constipation gets better, we can, you know, put the endo thing possibly to the side, but if things don't get better, you have to see an endo specialist. And then they're like, okay, I'm willing to do that. You can buy me some time without having a surgery just yet before we go into, you know, endometriosis evaluation. Cause there's, they're, they freak out. They're like, well, well I don't want to have endo surgery if I don't have endometriosis and I'm, but I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure, but you know, so you kind of, we, we have to play, um, you know, devil's advocate and make sure, but for a lot of these patients, they don't want to evaluate unless they're sure they have it. And I think no parent wants to put a kid through surgery. So this is a per, go ahead, Dr. Orbach. We're going to yeah. transition after this comment. What do we do? How do we treat a teen? Yeah. I just wanted to comment, you know, I see gut issues all throughout the month not necessarily a week preceding the period, even in a nine-year-old or a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old. So I think it's an important distinction just for those out there to know that like endo isn't just period pain or the week before one's menses. It's it really, the pain or the gut is, can occur any time of the month. And then Secondly, just to throw in, even when I love getting teens as consults, I don't jump and operate on them. Honestly, the first thing that I do is I educate them. I give them proper information. 
I send them to pelvic floor PT. That's the first thing that I do. We work on their gut. Obviously I send them to, you know, physical medicine rehab to you guys, wherever in the country, you guys are popping up Mm -hmm. and I work on getting them to meditate mindfulness. I I never jump to surgery. So, you know, I think that's important that multi. Yeah. And I, I I have them read your book. I'm like, okay, Okay. check off. (laughs) <laughs> Beating endo on the bottom, read that. And then we'll talk about it. <laughs> Dr. O'Roddy, what goes into the treatment sort of algorithm of how you're going to proceed with a team? Um, I mean, it's, it's a, again, multidisciplinary. So, and it depends on the extent of their symptoms. And yes, I didn't mean to imply that they only have the symptoms preceding the period. Usually right. it's initially just preceding the period. And then eventually they have it all month long. Um, um, but I do work with a GI doctor that sees basically all of my endo patients. She's very holistic approach, dietary approach, you know, anti-inflammatory. I work with the pelvic floor PT acupuncture. Um, uh, we have a therapist also that works with teens uh, with regards to, you know, pelvic pain and being able to manage, you know, schoolwork and, 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 and navigating through that. So I, 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 I do that multidisciplinary approach. Um, some, sometimes if they have severe urinary symptoms, I will do bladder installations on teens. Although mostly I, I do them on, um, on older patients. Cause usually it seems like the GI symptoms come first. The GU symptoms come, seem to come a little bit later in like the timeline of endometriosis. And then I do offer them, you know, suppression of their menstrual cycle, just so that they don't have to have a menstrual cycle, whether that be usually with an uh, IUD or norethindrone or something like that, um, in order to to kind of just give them some relief from the menstrual symptoms and see if we can find something that that suppresses them. Um, and then it depends also on the severity of their symptoms and the severity of their disease. I do do it. Uh, I do an abdominal exam. I don't tend to do a pelvic exam unless they are, they are sexually active. Um, but I do a transabdominal ultrasound also in my office just to make sure they don't have an endometrioma, um, that their uterus isn't severely shifted, that their adenomyosis isn't severe. Some of them have adenomyosis, obviously, as well. Um, and the ones that do have adenomyosis, I do tend to push more towards suppressive therapy because some of them are really iron deficient and anemic from their heavy menses from the, from the associated adenomyosis. So, I mean, I, I, I work with psych, you know, PT, pelvic floor, GI, you know, me, GYN. Um, and then if we do go to surgery, um, sometimes I will work with, uh, with a, G, uh, with a general surgeon. Um, if I think they have pretty severe disease, which some of them actually do have, I just operated on a 18 year old with bilateral endometriomas and rectal endometriosis the other day. And her sister now has the same thing. And her sister's 16. So we're trying to treat her medically right now. Um, and we're just observing her. So it, now, it's multiple. we have to take off the four of us, the best of the best hats that we wear. How does the average teenager get treated? Let's be honest now, because I mean, we well, can't reach them all. Yeah. You know, what do you think, Dr. Orbach, about the average treatment of a, a teenager who has constipation, painful periods, bloating? Um, what do you think about how they get treated? Like, what, what do they, they go to the doctor and what typically happens? Usually they go to a GI doctor first, I think. Yeah. Or they go to the pediatrician first okay. get, get put on Miralax maybe yeah yeah oh Miralax that's very relaxed nice. Miralax. maybe Miralax. dietary changes if they're a little bit progressive maybe a birth control pill um yeah. but I don't think they ever get like colonoscopy yeah you treat a colonoscopy which and then an upper endoscopy on a separate visit and then medical trauma from those two visits then you know it's it's just devastating yeah. And if they make it to a GYN, what is the, so we have our own algorithm. What's, what is a regular GYN typically? Off? Cause I think that. I mean, you know, everybody we, gets birth control pills for everything when a regular GYN happens, which it, it just makes no sense to me because the estrogen, estrogen, endometriosis is estrogen dependent. It makes no sense to put them on birth control pills in the first place. Like, so 
to the me, problem is, is they're not even being told the word endometriosis. They're just saying, right. Here, try the pill. And so patients are just like, okay, I'll, I'll do this pill and maybe it's helping. And maybe I, but they don't have no idea why they're being put on yeah. it. And it typically fails. Like it might help a little bit and then they have side effects and it doesn't really help and they still have the symptoms and then they usually stop it because they yeah. don't like it. Yeah. So, the side effects. And then so, how do you unwind all that medical trauma? So then they wait, they avoid doctors for five years. Yeah. What, what I usually say to them, and, and this is true, this is how I open when I'm discussing with teens or any endo patient for that matter. I tell them that I learned more in my first week of fellowship about endometriosis than I did in four years of OBGYN training plus four years of medical school, or I learned less in eight yeah. years of training than I did in my first week of fellowship. So I, I always tell them that there's so much misinformation online. Gynecologists, it's not their fault. There's so much misinformation. So let's just start from scratch with the basics, create a foundation, and then I re-educate them. Yeah. Yeah, I think now it's better when they have a parent that has endometriosis because they kind of understand already, mm -hmm. you know, and they've been through it. So it's a little bit easier. I think it's harder when it, the parent doesn't have endometriosis. Um, and the teen is like advocating for themselves and saying like, I have a lot of now adults who were really traumatized as teenagers because they were basically told that they were crazy or, you know, that there's something wrong with them. And now they have this, this mental trauma or, or even worse, they were laparoscoped and told they didn't have endo when they really did. So now they were like invalidated. And, mm -hmm. and some of those patients now are chronic pain patients and it's just really hard to backpedal and recover from that. Like it's just, it's really, but I, th I think the worst though, is like trying to explain to a, a patient who's young and not even young. I have like 20 year old, 25 year old people like that I'm around like office people I work with that'll, that just don't understand that endo is not in the uterus and say, okay, well I'll get a hysterectomy. Yeah. And I don't know how many times I can say it, but like literally they don't like, yeah. it's, I don't, I don't know how we can change that because literally I deal with this. I don't know how you do it, Sally. I really don't. Um, I, uh, I think that, you know, I, I met with a whole bunch of doctors and, and, you know, they don't even understand that. I think there are so, and obviously we have Dr. Redwine, he comes to the endometriosis summit and he's going to talk about the damage of this notion that you know, it's a uterine based um, disease, but one of the, the issues also becomes this, how to get diagnosis because a teen, so if a teen heads to one of our docs, one of you guys, they're going to get basically, here's the interventions from doing nothing to aspirin, to birth control, to, you know, they'll get the concept of everything. Someone will speak to them that their bladder could be misfiring. Someone will, right. But the average person just gets handed birth control pills and they don't, maybe they go online and they'll hear it, but you're not actually diagnosed when they're handing you a medication. And well, oftentimes that, they're told it's normal. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. Right. You're in pain. That's normal. You're supposed to be in pain. It's part of being a woman. Welcome to womanhood you know, and it, it's like, they, they that's or you're too young to have endo. Yeah. You're too, oh. you're too young. Oh, that one. Yeah. The too young to have endo. Like uh, that's Dr. Orbach, youngest patient you operated on. Uh, I've had a few 12 year olds, but, yeah. but I, ha I do do consult. My youngest consult was a nine, 10 years old. And, uh, like she's still working on pelvic floor PT, gut health, integrative nutrition, meditation challenge, like all these things are, I'm still working on with that age group. Right. I think that, um, that, that handing someone, a, a you know, you're not going to do anything invasive with pelvic floor therapy, right? You're not going to, for the most part, damage somebody with that, but starting to play with their hormones. And there are other drugs that are much more invasive than, um, birth control pills in teenagers who aren't diagnosed, that's sort of a gray area to me because it, we, we shouldn't be treating what we don't know they have. And, and you should have seen what came up on Instagram when I asked for questions this evening about the drugs that people had been handed. 
So let's talk about that for a moment. We also have to be careful with, with the hormones on, in teenagers a little bit because of bone health, right? That's how they're developing their bone density. A lot of their bone acquisition occurs in those early postmenarchal years. So we do have to be a little bit careful about how much hormones or suppression we're going to put them on. So well, that's really important to, you My know, meeting this morning was with a menopause that. group. And yeah. there's actually a very direct link between dementia and absence of estrogen. And I, I, I was in, I just to think about, you're also building brain health in your teen, you know, you're, you're building your microbiome forever in your teen years. You know, we talked about that, um, last week, we talked about that in terms of fertility also. And so, you know, it, it's, it's tough to see what goes on with other people. When do you make the decision to operate Dr. Orbach? You know, it, I really individualize the care for every patient. And I always ask them, what are their goals? And obviously the family member who's bringing them. And that, that helps me determine my timeline. Um, and like what I, in general, I'm always offering everything non-surgical and but before, before I operate on them, but it just depends. Some patients really push me for surgery sooner than later, just because of school scheduling, summer camp scheduling, or whatever it is. So I try and work within what their goals are always. Um, but typically I always find more PT better, more gut health better. Like I've gotten, I think back to where I started when I finished my fellowship, I'd write these scripts for narcotics, 35, you know, Norco, which is, you know, like generic Vicodin. Now my average patient, whether they're 45 year old with chronic pain or a teenager, they're taking between zero and two narcotics. Post-op. Post-op. Yeah. Even I'm telling you like a crazy long surgery, they're taking between zero and two narcotics because I'm doing so much work on the front end and I'm getting them, you know, into every, every aspect from, from literally from head to toe. Um, and it, it, it makes such a difference. So, yeah. Yeah. I think also the days of we had, we'll have Dr. Dupree on, on a whole evening, but we did a live with her. Who's our pain science lecturer this year. And she could tell you all about, there are certain brains that are wired very differently for the drugs and for pain. And we don't want to test the waters with a teen. So like to teach other management techniques becomes, I think, really important. Mm -hmm. In terms of surgery, Dr. Orati, um, what are your options in how you operate? Because you're going to share something with us that I think not a lot of endo summit people know a lot about. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, I'm with Dr. Orbach. I delay surgery as much as possible. Very individualized, very like uh, you know, looking at their goals, but, um, for teens and especially patients who with minimal symptoms, fertility patients, um, the patient that doesn't believe they have endo, I usually offer them or, or patients that I think don't have, you know, DIE rectal endo or something where I'm going to have to go deep into, you know, the pararectal spaces or, um, into the nerve bundles, you know, pudendal and, and hypogastric nerves. I'm not doing a, a severely deep dissection. I do offer uh, mini micro laparoscopy for those patients, which I think is ideal because um, it leaves uh, the, 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 the camera is a three millimeter scope. The instruments are two to three millimeters in size. Oh, the little man is there. Oh, sorry. The instruments are two to three millimeters in size, and you can do a complete excision of endometriosis laparoscopically with these micro instruments. Um, and I, I do have some video or like a couple slides if you want me to, to just show that to you guys. Um, Mona so called me this morning. She's pretty good. Like, do you want, do you want some slides? I do. Oh. I do. Okay. So let me share my screen here. You know, I want our lab to be on mini microsurgery, but I have to catch up with Boston Scientific about it. I'm sure we can do it. So I'm going to skip the part about, I, I have a whole thing, but I want to go just to- Mona's an overachiever. Yeah. Well, here's an article that you can look up that actually has a video of me doing mini microlaparoscopy and endometriosis. It's um, 
on endofound.org, can you have endo excision surgery minus the downtime? And it is true with, with these micro instruments, um, you can overcome some of the kind of barriers to having surgery because of pain, need for post-op narcotics, time off work, time to return to exercise, and the scarring, because as you can see, the instruments are micro instruments. So this is a percutaneous two millimeter, basically a 14 gauge needle that has a grasper in it. This is a three millimeter port with a scissors in it. And this is a three millimeter port with a scope, a three millimeter scope. Um, and the instruments are literally micro instruments. So they're extremely small and you have everything from scissors to a bipolar, to a grasper, to a suction irrigator, um, to needle drivers, if I want to suspend the ovaries, I can, I can suspend the ovaries that I can, uh, that I can do a full excision of endometriosis using these instruments. And some of them are going to be percutaneous, which are these two, these slim 2.3 millimeter instruments that go directly through the skin. And, um, this, um, this patient actually was an acrobat and this is her I just wanna show you the size of these incisions. This is the incision three days post-op. So this is a 2.5 millimeter incision. This is a three millimeter incision. And this is a three millimeter incision. And seven days post-op, you can't even see the, if you look at it, it's like as big as a hair follicle. It's right there, there, there. And then this is her seven days post-op. So because of the size of the incisions, it's basically like a, a needle that goes through the abdominal wall, there is no downtime in terms of exercise. So I, a lot of my teenagers are athletes, they run, they row, they play basketball, and they don't wanna be you know, restricted from physical activity for a lot of a long time. And this basically puts them back, right back into their physical activity regimen within seven days. This patient's literally, she's up on the pole there. I can't do that at all ever, but 10 days post stop, she was doing, you know, acrobatics and, 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 you know, I operated on her like a week before opening night. She was a Cirque du Soleil, um, acrobat. And that was what convinced me that mini microlaparoscopy really is a game changer, especially for young women who are extremely active, who maybe the reason they don't want to do surgery is because they're afraid of the downtime and the incisions. Um, and if we can diagnose it early, maybe we can prevent, you know, the pelvic pain, the infertility, the chronic pain, all the downstream options, the, the anxiety, the depression that we see in our patients that are, you know, not, not adequately diagnosed and treated early on. But I do want to show you one video at least so that you can see kind of what the surgery looks like. This is a percutaneous instrument. You can literally see like those are the blood vessels. Like this instrument is a two millimeter instrument. You can use it to manipulate and evaluate the pelvis. Here I chromoperturbated, here's the appendix. I'm just gonna lift up. You're gonna see a little spot of endometriosis kind of right there. And then on the other side, it's a little more extensive. This patient was a college student on the track team, had, was in a, had a scholarship for track. So again, she had severe dyspareunia, severe pelvic pain, dys dysmenorrhea, had basically failed medical management and came to me and um, I offered her endo excision surgery. And you can see here, there's a patch of endometriosis right on the pelvic side wall here with, you know, a ureter there. And you can do the dissection just the same way you would do laparoscopically. I'm gonna introduce um, a scissors. She has a little spot on the bladder, a little bit in the pararectal space. Um, and again, same, same way you would do normally. And you can do even more extensive endometriosis with this. This is just an example. But basically, I'm going to grasp the endometriosis with the grasper, and then I'm going to use the scissors to open the retroperitoneal space, dissect the ureter, and excise that peritoneum um, the same way I would laparoscopically. So um, it, it is actually, I, for me, a game changer, especially for, as I said, teenagers, young women. I have a lot of patients with infertility that just don't believe they have endometriosis, um, and when I offer them this, they're much more likely to say, okay, I will, you know, have a diagnostic laparoscopy because literally these patients will have the surgery on Friday and on Monday, they're back to normal activities. And, you know, once they've gotten through like the bloating and the constipation post-op and things like that, but you can see, like you can do just a simple excision. I'm going to dissect out the ureter. but this is just an example. You can see how tiny the, the instruments are and the abdominal wall I mean, the incisions are literally invisible. I, I, you, 
after a month or two, you can't even like, I literally have to look very closely to see where, where the incisions were. So this is what that patient's abdomen looked, you know, six weeks post-op. There's one incision there, the one in the umbilicus you can't even see. And there's a third one somewhere over here, which I can't even point out. And then a fourth one right there. Okay. So not to take too much time, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, this is what it looks like externally. Um, and I have a couple of other videos, but almost all the patients will go back to normal activities within one to two days post-op. Incisions are invisible two weeks post-op. There's no requirement for any post-op narcotic pain meds. They, they literally have almost no pain post-op. And there's no sutures. You, you just put a little drop of dermabond on each of these little incision sites and that's it. Okay. All right. I'm gonna stop sharing. You know, it's very interesting because I think that we're seeing um, more and more involvement with connective tissue disorder and endometriosis. I know, um, I know certainly Dr. Orbuck works a lot with that, but I wonder about the, and it's off topic, I get it, but about using mini lap and the um, connective tissue patient because it's less of an incision. I mean, it's definitely less of an incision. There's, there's almost no it's almost no incision to tell you the truth. I mean, the, 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 I, I can't describe to you how small these instruments are there. It's go ahead, doctor. Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment about the difference between uh, visualization laparoscopically and robotically. You know, I was trained minimally invasively laparoscopically before Da Vinci even was FDA approved for uh, GYN. It was approved for urology and I really thought based on who trained me, I could do anything laparoscopically. And I decided to get training. I forget how long ago, maybe 12 years ago or so. And robotics, I just felt like I was too young. I needed to know a little bit more. I needed to have like, I wanted to know everything. And I went in not with intention of changing over my practice, but just, I want to know what's out there. And I remember I sat down on that on the robot with that 3D high definition visualization. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And for my teenagers, cause I start all my surgeries with a laparoscope, which is 2D um, only because it's light. I do a direct insertion and it's like lighter for my hand. And then I swap it over to a robotics a 3D high definition scope, my nurses crack up because when I sit down on like to start operating, I'm like, oh my God, I didn't see endo here or here or here or here. I see so much more with my robotic camera than I do with my laparoscopic camera. And I, I think, yeah, it's great to have the mini laparoscopy, but like the scope is an eight millimeter scope. And I see so much more in particular because teen endo are clear lesions. Yeah. And I know every single surgery, I'm seeing a laparoscopic view and I'm seeing a robotic view. And I am convinced that I can see so much more in a teen for a teenager um, utilizing a robotic scope. So that's, you know, that's- I mean, I, I do that too. And I convert lot mini to robot if I, yeah. if I find extensive endometriosis. But I mean, I'm very, very meticulous. And we, we have a 4K- um, system. So oh, great. It, it's 4k and I magnify 10 X. So what you're, what I see with the mini scope, I, I swear to you is almost as good, especially mm -hmm. when I zoom in all the way and I really survey everything. Um, so, and I remove anything that looks at, at all suspicious. Like I don't just look for the clear lesions. I look for the mm -hmm. hypervascularity, the oh, torture right. vessels, and almost all of it comes back endometriosis too. I think if you do a cursory look like we do with the survey, I do do a survey when I do robotics. I think if you're doing a cursory look, yeah, you'll miss a lot of it. And a lot of times, even with the mini initially, I won't see that much, but once I like lit literally go, I, and I systematically go through the whole pelvis and I zoom in and I have the 4K and I zoom in, I zoom in like 10X. Mm -hmm. So my screen is huge and I'm literally looking at every inch of the peritoneum. You can still find it. I agree. You can see better robotically, mm -hmm. but I think with a meticulous, you know, and having 4k and high definition, I think you can, you can see mm -hmm. the same thing, but, but I agree. I, I, I love the robot and I use it a lot. Um, I would say about 20% of my surgeries are mini and 80% are robotic, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's nice to be able to offer that to patients. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. I'm obsessed with this conversation because the whole thing is that I want with the summit for us to be able to drive conversation in a direction that interests also the people having the conversation. Do you know what, you know, not in a, in not a conversation driven people, by my sponsors. Yeah. No, but yeah, I yeah. do believe that, pay, that, that a lot of gynecologists, like they get fooled with the laparoscope. Like I've had so many patients mm-hmm. with literally negative laparoscopy and you go in and they have like endo everywhere. Yeah. Like, how did they say this is negative? Like, it's like the whole pelvis is covered. And, yeah, how and- do they say that that's negative? Dr. They don't Orba. look hard enough. They don't, they don't look hard enough. They don't know what it looks like. They don't know the different very iterations of endo. Um, and, and that, you know, it's just lack of training. Yeah, so. I think it's lack of training for sure. And um, for me, I, I don't know what you use, Mona, but I use a Valchev manipulator. And that's a particular manipulator Harry Rich always used. And that really opens, not opens up, but delineates that um, posterior cervix down to the rectovaginal septum. I use a roomy where I can, you know, same, bend the yeah. same concept. And, and I really I, do, it, you really can see better with that. Yeah, I think general gynecologists are using a HUMI, which is like the worst manipulator, like known to, like it's awful. And it doesn't allow you to look where the high yield areas are. And like to quote Harry Rich, he calls it a picoscopy, you know, because they're doing it so quick. The reimbursement's so sucky. They're putting the scope in. They got to get to the next six or seven patients. A, they're not trained. They don't know what endo looks like. They don't know teenage endo looks different. And C, they're just like doing a quick look and they're almost like confirming their suspicions because they don't even believe teen endo even exists. So they're doing a quick laparoscopy or picoscopy and being like, no, it's not there. You know, it's just, it's just all bad on, on every level. I mean, even the one that I showed you, which obviously is endo, a lot of gynecologists wouldn't have seen that. Mm -hmm. They would have said, Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a little puckering, whatever. Yeah. So meanwhile, that case is how I met you. And we were, I, you know, we were out and you were talking about it and I'm like a huge Cirque du Soleil fan. So I decided, oh, I should become friends with you because I want to learn about, you know, it's very funny. And, And the other thing I always think of is that both of you are trained in traditional surgery and then you move to the robot. So you yeah. have skills no matter what. I think mm-hmm. when a lot of the residents and fellows come out now, they have only robotic skills. What do you, I know it's not a robot night, it's teen night, but what do you think about that? You know, what, well, I, th- I, think I think it's such an both. advantage to be trained in both. Have, I think you should have both. I mean, robotics is laparoscopy, just, you know, with an advanced tool, but I mean, basic laparoscopy should be, you should be able to do it laparoscopically too. You know what I mean? Um, and that should be part of basic surgical training. Um, I, I really think you should have both. And, and I've been doing robotic surgery since 2007. So, you know, it's not like, you know, and again, it was the same thing, Iris. I was doing everything laparoscopically and I'm like, this instrument sounds interesting. Let me <laughs> try it out. And then I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much you can do with this thing. Yeah. And, and I became, uh, uh, you know, an avid user. Um, for the same reasons that, that you say, you can see better, you can move better, you can get into deeper spaces, dissection is better, less bleeding, all of that, less trauma, which I do believe is really mm-hmm. important, mm-hmm. especially for our younger patients to prevent adhesions and future fertility issues and stuff like that. But I still think, you know, they should do be able to do everything, hysteroscopy, cystoscopy, laparoscopy, robotics, whatever part of it, I mean, all of it needs to be included, yeah. you know. I, I want to make a just one is it's it's not the instrument that makes the surgeon it's the surgeon that makes the successful surgery so i think there's thankfully these days there's fewer and fewer robotic naysayers those tend to be the people who did 20 surgeries or 30 i would say my learning curve was probably like 70 or so and i trained for a year before i touched a patient i used to go to the hospital in the evenings to train before i did my first surgery so i it's I don't think it's like, oh, go to that doctor because they just do robotics, even though I'm a robotic, you know, mm-hmm. fan. I think it's the surgeon who makes the successful surgery. What is it? It's the singer of the song, not the song. It's a, what's his yeah. big line? We'll give we'll give a shout out to Dr. Miller because he has that line. Yeah. <laughs> He's a great singer too. He's got a great voice, by the way. I, I, I only saw video. I was not <laughs> there, but I've seen the Instagram. 
I mean, I always yeah. use the use the akin to like a pianist, like a concert pianist with this piano, with a fancy piano, can still play on a not fancy piano. Whereas you take a a, a pianist who's taken some piano lessons or went to piano school, they're still not going to be a concert pianist, <clears throat> no matter how good a piano you put under their hands, right? It's right. It, it it's it's the skill itself. It's the it's in an, some of it is innate and some of it is learned, but. You know, it's just that's that's how it is, and I, I, you know, most people, hopefully, will filter out what they can and can't do. Well, let's talk about probably the most important component of teen endometriosis, and that's advocacy. Um, everybody here is involved in a lot of different efforts, um, but Dr. Orbach, you're certainly involved in one of the more exciting efforts that's going on going on these days, like. People have cramps or stomach aches, and they typically head to the school nurse's office. Um, what kind of advocacy efforts are you involved in that you want to um, share, Dr. Orbach? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I can talk about a bunch of stuff that um, I can share now, and then we have the coolest stuff coming down the pipeline that I can't wait to share um, at the end of the first quarter of this year. But uh, the School Nurses Initiative, which is Shannon Cohn's initiative, Endo What, and Shannon and I have been collaborating together for a really long time to raise awareness. So with the goal of putting a, um, a kit in every school nurse's office across the country, and that kit is a poster that talks about painful periods, it's a DVD or an online um, download, educating the school nurse as to the signs and symptoms. So then Hopefully that 12, 13, 15 year old who's experiencing pain will hear from the nurse, geez, I wonder if you have endometriosis. So that, that word is being heard for the first time. Um, so that has been extremely effective. And for anyone who's out there, it, if they haven't watched the Endo What documentary, you can download it at, what is it, endowhat.org or endowhat.com. And 100% of the proceeds go to put a copy of this DVD in every school nurse's office. And you can even choose your own school nurse um, your own school to send a uh, kit there. Um, we're also uh, training uh, nurses. There's medical school initiatives now. Um, and then, you know, there's there's some really cool stuff coming down the pipeline too. Right. So the Endometriosis Summit took the money it raised throughout the year. And I think we bought a hundred nurses kits. We wow. size, right. Wow, we, that's I, awesome. I, I, it might be 50. I mean, I'm waiting. So Shannon did not announce this yet but I know it because I run the books and I know what what check was written but um we decided to join that initiative um and we also wanted to support while it's not teen endometriosis can you talk a little bit about the college campus tour because I yeah. think even me who's been an advocate for a very long time when I saw the college campus tour which was I think the first location your daughter ran I, it like clicked and I like finally got it that what the difference a little bit of endometriosis education can make for people. Yeah. And that was sort of like a beta test. So my daughter um, goes to Princeton. She herself has endo. She had gut issues from when she's nine and she had a, she, she did PT, integrative nutrition, mind body. I mean, the whole gamut and then a great excision surgery. And so, she experiences the same thing that each one of us who's sitting here experiences. So many of her friends have, you know, painful periods, gut issues. And she calls me, she's like, mom, it's another one diagnosed with PCOS, you know, and my daughter is smart enough to know PCOS does not cause pain. She's spinning her wheel. She's so frustrated because she's like this, um, she's like a battalion leader trying to raise awareness. And uh, anyways, so she joined forces with Shannon and actually I think she was the second college tour. And you first know- that doesn't count. Okay, the, other, the first, the first one doesn't okay. count because that was by a big foundation. Right, this one Alexandra did with no funding, yeah. no money. Like, she, uh, you know, Sally, you know, came in, I flew in, um, Shannon flew in. And the, the greatest thing is we had the school nurse of Princeton there. So she's now gonna pick up all of these students. And there were, you know, sufferers, sufferers partners, there were friends of those who are suffering. And 
it was just like a really low budget thing that helped pick up so many people. And as we went through it afterwards, because I went to Princeton the day before, and I said to my daughter afterwards, I'm saying, oh my God, we should have done the sororities. We should have done the yoga classes. We should have done the gym. So just by going through it, I had so many ideas. So wherever the next one is, and I know Shannon has a bunch of schools already set in the pipeline, like it can be that much more successful and unified. And it's just, it's such a great way. But it's a conversation way. piece that yeah. none of the four of us had, you Correct. know, we we, we, none of us sat around and talked about endometriosis in college or, or saw the, your daughter did the smartest thing and that she took the flyer and taped it to the back of the bathroom stalls. Yeah. You know, none of us saw that. So Dr. Ahmed, tell me a little bit about, um, your, you know, what you see the future directions for, um, conversations about the period and, and how, um, you're working to change that so that we're not just normalizing cramps. Oh uh, my gosh. My, my, I have a nine-year-old and I have an, an, um, an 11 year old. And every time they have a stomach ache, I, in my head where we are going to GI doctors right now, cause everyone's throwing up all the time. Um, and I'm literally in shock that the pediatricians never asked them about their, you know, any of their symptoms. And, um, you know, it's really scary that this is what Manhattan, New York is like. And you're, you've you been saying this all day, like what about the average teen? I mean, obviously it has to start in all the pediatrician offices mm -hmm. and I don't know um, how it's gonna change, but I think we have to start in the elementary schools, the middle schools, um, the, that whole conversation has to change. And I mean, I think colleges are great because that's going to be where it's going down, but like the, the whole fertility conversation has to happen early so that, you know, parents want their grandchildren. And I think, um, it has to start early and, and, and I, I'm, they're coming, they're coming too late to me. Mm -hmm. It has to be, it has to be done before they get to me. I mean, we also need to educate like GI doctors, inter pediatricians, internal medicine doctors, like the GI doctor I now work with when she first graduated fellowship, she, she joined our group. She didn't know anything about endometriosis. Like, and now she's like diagnosing it left and right on patients who aren't even seeing a guy they're seeing her for IBS or whatever. So it's really amazing that they don't get any education about mm -hmm. it. We, we do outreach all the time. We go to pedi uh, GI offices all the time and they mm -hmm. literally do not ask anything about any their cycles or anything mm -mm. Mm -hmm. well but when one gi is trained and they know what they're doing it's like a godsend to probably yes. 50 or 60 women a month you know so like i worked with a gi in new york and it was like life life altering for the people that got to see that particular gi so dr orati what do you think um we have a question from the crowd and it says how do you teach people to advocate for themselves? So first of all, the number one way to teach somebody to advocate for themselves is to send them to the endometriosis summit because it's three days, whether you come in person or online, all about how to advocate for yourself. But putting that aside for a moment, how do you teach someone to advocate for themselves? I mean, honestly, it's just a matter of education and that, and I think women are, are really prone, even as I said, I, I told you about my story with my, with my childbirth and all that, even I was prone to just be poo-pooed and belittled and like what, you, what you're worried about is just all in your head and anxiety and stuff like that. And it's amazing how much, you know, women will believe that their symptoms or, you know, what they're feeling or the things that are going wrong with them are just, is just anxiety or something mm -hmm. like that. I think that has to stop. We, we, as women have to stop thinking that, oh, we're just anxious or, oh, we're just overreacting or we're just too sensitive. Like this is wrong. Women have intuition. We should trust our gut. And I think that's what the biggest thing I tell my patients is if you feel like you have a symptom, like something is wrong, I believe you. I have patients who've come to me one or two years post a complete excision. They're like, I think my endo is back. I'm like, I believe you. And you go in and their endo is back. So it's like, you have to, you have to put that trust in their own instinct in them, in their, in your patients, in yourself. And I think that's the biggest thing. Once you trust your own instincts, 
then you can advocate. You won't let someone say, oh, oh, you're not really having those symptoms. Oh, it's all in your head. Oh, you're just anxious. I think that's the biggest thing. Just trust yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dr. Please. Horbuck, how do you teach somebody to advocate for themselves? I, I just explain to them that you really need to trust your gut and your pain is real. And, and even a 13 year old I get in my office already, it takes me a long time to get them to believe that their pain is real because they've been told by numerous um, healthcare providers that it's in their head. They look fine. So I validate them and explain to them, we don't see it on imaging. They're like, really? My pediatrician told me because my ultrasound's normal. There's nothing wrong with me. You know, it's just, you just have to, I know, I know. I want a whole night on but your ultrasound's normal, so what? Like, I, yeah. I, I want to do, I want to yeah. line up my favorite faculty members and have that discussion because we've all, we've all had it with that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, when I took my daughter, you know, also in Manhattan, to the best of the best of the best, nobody mentioned endo. And I knew it was endo, but I didn't want to diagnose my daughter. I was told it was like, she's precocious. She's smart. She's this, Mm -hmm. she's that it's, I'm like, oh my gosh. That's why she wrote that piece that was in Stylecaster talking about her journey. I mean, I had a doctor fairly recently who I really respect say to me, oh, you're like nudgy though. You're nudgy with your pain. That's how you are. Could you order the CAT scan anyway? And literally 24 hours later, I was in surgery. You know, I, I think that that we have become as a culture, and this is we're gonna have Dr. Bobel. I don't know if you've ever met Chris Bobel, mm-hmm. but she's really gonna dive deep into sort of the history of menstruation and the patriarchy on why we normalize that. That's gonna kick off the endometriosis summit. It's gonna be really cool. Okay, as we wind down, because we have to, even though we love each other, we have to leave. <laughs> um, the endometriosis summit is March 24th through the 26th in celebration, Florida and virtually. And I go around as we, um, end every evening on, um, what are you looking forward to the most about the endometriosis summit? We'll start with you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing people in person. I think I say this every year. I'm hoping COVID's really over this time. Um, you know, it's always wonderful to see actual people. I mean, now that this has been around for like three years, there's people from endometriosis summit one that will come to me and say like, remember when you told me you thought I had endometriosis three years ago? Well, I do. And now I feel so much better and I'm lifting this and I'm lifting that. Um, and I can work out and I can like live my life. And I think it's nice to see people full circle. I actually am looking very much forward to your talk because we're going to talk about the pros and cons of a hot pack and what that may or may not do to your nerves, um, which that's a very important topic because a lot of us wear our hot pack burns as like warrior wounds, but should we really be doing that? And you'll have to tune in to see. So Dr. O'Reilly, what are you most looking forward to at the end of each? We hope you get to do the mini laparoscopy uh, lab. I Dr. hope I get to do the mini laparoscopy lab. I mean, just talking with my fellow colleagues and learning so much from them. I mean, we, we're always constantly learning and growing um, and sharing what my experience is, learning from others' experiences, meeting people who are just as passionate about endometriosis as me is, you know, the, the biggest thing. And I tell all of my patients about Endo Summit and tell them they should they should join. And So and- last year, Dr. Yeah. Arati got to show patients how to operate, but she used apples instead of people. Yeah. And let me tell you, in the review of the summit, people loved that. They thought that was amazing. They, they had a good time with the laser. We were doing a laser uh, laser course and it was, it was amazing because they could see what kind of energy you know, what, what a a big difference the laser makes in terms of, you know, as an energy use and things like that. So, and Dr. Orbach, one of my original faculty, um, actually everybody always asks me why it's on a Sunday because the very first one, that was the day Dr. Orbach could come (laughs) pick like this one specific day. And, um, that was the day that you could come. And then it started the tradition that the big day was on Sunday. That's really, you should know that everything is so random with us. But how, um, what are you looking forward to about the summit? 
Uh, you know what I love what the summit does and no one else does is you really talk about everything from head to toe, but I love the whole mental health aspect that you spend a lot of time addressing because no one is addressing the traumas and the brain and then the brain gut connection and then the gut. Um, these things are so absolutely important. I mean, obviously I love connecting with all of my friends and colleagues. I love learning. I learn a lot. Um, because you have, you know, experts in every discipline and it takes a village, you know, I, I never just take care of a patient by myself. I have like a whole team and it, and, and I think you've really adopted the team approach. And I think that's why, you know, patients are doing better and better because we're approaching it from, you know, the whole body. So thank you. Yeah. This year we added um, something called a relaxation station because a patient came to me or an attendee came to me and said, they were triggered by watching all the surgical videos. And I said, well, what can we do to, to help with that? And we, we created a whole experience for that. Um, and we have Dr. Millspa coming. Actually, she's going to do some anger release um, because we always find our, our crowd is so angry. But I was on a call with her, and this is for 2024, should Andrea and I make it that far. Um, there's actually research that shows the stress makes the inflammatory component of the endometriosis a lot wor worse. And so we're going to do a whole hour on that next year because I didn't hear the, her presented till the, whatever. Um, so that's the endometriosis summit. Uh, everybody could, uh, Dr. Ahmed, people want to reach you. Where do they go? At Dr. T-A-Y Ahmed, A-H-M-E-D on Instagram or pelvicrehabilitation.com. And Dr. O'Rady, how can they reach you? Uh, it's www.drmonaorady.care. I, I saw your new website. I liked it. Thank you. And Dr. Orbach, where can we reach you? Probably the easiest is Instagram, D-R-I-R-I-S-O-R-B-U-C-H. Or if you want to catch me on a web, it's uh, L-A-G-Y-N-D-R.com, like L-A-G-Y-N doctor.com. Yes, excellent. All right. So this concludes um, this evening. Next week is bladder night. Um, and of course, anyone who wants to come back can come back. But next week, we're going to talk all about the bladder and endometriosis and my uh, grouping of nerves called S2, 3, and 4. And we're going to have Dr. Chung and Dr. Larish is coming, though he doesn't know he's coming yet. Um, and I like to watch the two of them go at it off script. Um, so oftentimes they don't tell them I'm recording because then they get very official, but this way they don't have to be so official. We're going to not tell them I'm recording. And that should be a very, very good evening. We will see you next Monday night. Um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Sally. Thank Bye, guys. You. Bye. Bye. Uh...